We've all seen those postcard type pictures of families where you've got mom and dad with their big perfect teeth and perfect smiles and the little kids there with the little blondie Swedish looking children with the big smiles and it's all good and uh, you know I, I, I use them sometimes for, for presentations so I do powerpoints on, on different things family life or whatever whatever it may be and at the time of this time of Christmas as well, we think of you know Christmas movies and again happy families and all coming together and sitting around the table and it's all beautiful and amazing. And yet, for many, the idea of family isn't actually that positive. Uh, for many people, the idea of home isn't actually a place of refuge and a place of peace and a place of unity uh, and a safe place from the temptations of darkness of the world. And this is becoming more and more so. Uh, any uh, teachers in, in our presence or are watching here will probably be aware of that as well. If they've been teaching, if their teaching career has spanned more than maybe 15 years, I'd say they would have noticed a huge difference uh, in 2005 in compar comparison to now. So, like the number of, of kids coming from difficult backgrounds, uh, homes where there, there isn't unity, home, places where uh, home, as I say, isn't, doesn't feel that safe. Uh, places where even when you're home, you have to go up to your room and hide in your, in your bedroom and, and spend your life on social media or online gaming and all this kind of stuff. So it's, it, it's a problem. It really is a problem. The lack of <clears throat> a solid family, right? the lack of a family unit that people can depend on. This kind of foundational relationship with our parents which sets us up for all other relationships you know if um, our family relationships are strong strong relationship with our parents then that means that I can I can take a risk you know I can ask a girl out and she might say yes and then it all goes well and then six months later yeah by the way it's not me it's you hang on it's not you it's me it's not you it's me it's just not working out uh, it's been nice but um, yeah this is I don't know it's uh, Let's just be friends, okay? Now, rather than that being absolutely earth-shattering, I just return to my foundation relationship with family, and I'm miserable and upset and that, but my world hasn't collapsed. If you take away that foundation, I start going out with a girl, 16 years, I'm 16, 17, 18 years of age, she breaks it off after six months, and <whistles> I'm in free fall. I just, I've no, what, what's, what's my kind of, what do I go back to? What's my foundation? If there isn't a strong family relationship, you often see this like with you know, 17, 18 year olds, the relationship breaks up and they're e devastated. Maybe even suicidal. Absolutely chronic stuff. And so much of it goes back to this, the solidity of the family. Why am I saying that? One line really, really stuck out for me today in our first reading. So it's from the book of Ecclesiasticus. And it's talking about Elijah, but we'll, we won't talk about him today. We haven't time. Uh, but... The, towards the end, it talks about Elijah's mission, what he came to do. So, has anyone reason to boast as you have, Elijah? Taken up in a whirlwind of fire, right? In a chariot with fiery horses. Designated in the prophecies of doom to allay God's wrath before the fury breaks and to turn the hearts of fathers towards their children. To turn the hearts of fathers towards their children. Now, you'd imagine that should kind of be taken for granted, that a father's heart would be turned towards his children. Well, clearly not. In, in our own experience of society, clearly not. Uh, and even back when this was written, clearly not. And don't get me wrong, there are, there are wonderful fathers out there, and thank God a lot of us <coughs> have had them as well, and been brought up by wonderful men who knew how to provide for and protect their families. But it's, it's becoming less and less common. It's becoming less and less common for men to understand what their actual role and vocation is. And becoming more and more common for men to grow up, as, as we deemed it a couple of weeks ago, just big man babies. Uh, they're <clears throat> 40, 45 years of age and addicted to online gaming. And that's what they do with all their spare time. Or back in the day, maybe it was addicted to just premiership matches on, on the weekend and all spare time, just waste your life in front of the TV, watching a ball getting knocked around the place. Um, but this is kind of what's happening, you know, where, where fathers don't know how to be dads. 
they can bring a child into the world, but they don't know how to, how to father the child, you know? So it's, 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 it's a problem. It's a real problem. That's something that, that God definitely uh, sees. Why? Because he's the source of all fatherhood. And he wants the fatherhood that, that he created, if you will, to be embodied <clears throat> in earthly fathers. So earthly fathers, have, have, and priests for that matter, have the responsibility of representing God's fatherhood, of being that spark of a divine fatherhood, and making it present and real and tangible and visible and practical here on earth. So it's, 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 it's an astounding privilege and reality, which maybe goes over the head of a lot of dads today. Because God wants to create for us a family. A family, a family here on earth, and most definitely a family in heaven. That brings us to Our Lady of Guadalupe, where uh, our Lord wants us to recognize Our Lady for who she is, you know, our Queen and our Mother. And so, when Juan Diego, Juan Dieguito, as uh, Our Lady called him, uh, when he was scaling the hill there in Tepeyac in 1531 on the 9th of December, and he sees this beautiful, young girl but not just like any beautiful young girl there was something celestial about even her voice her presence everything and he recognized her he recognized her for who she was our blessed lady what did she ask she asked for a, a, a church to be built up there on Tepeyac and you can imagine his initial reaction we have a church and actually a cathedral down the hill why on earth do we need a church here and who am I to ask the Archbishop to build a church? But if you say so, and so he goes on, and he speaks to the Archbishop, and understandably, I mean, I think if any of us were an Archbishop, and some man were to turn up at your door and say, how are you getting on? I've just seen Our Lady, and she asked that we build uh, a church there in Stephen Amon. I'd say, great, we, we'll pray about that. That's what we're going to do, right? We're going to pray about that. But I mean, you're not going to, you know, you're not going to be calling CISC builders to get some cranes set up there. You know what I mean? You're not, Jeannie. So anyway, uh, he doesn't really, the bishop didn't really believe him, understandably. Uh, so Juan Diego returns to the hill, actually trying to dodge Our Lady, because he wants it to, he wants to get back to his uncle, long story. Uh, but Our Lady <laughs> tracks him down <laughs> and appears to him again. And... She says him that she'll give him a sign, so to scale the hill a little more and pick up, pick roses. Now obviously this is December, not the season for roses. And he finds all these beautiful roses, picks them up, puts them into his tilma, which isn't too unlike my chasuble. Puts them all into his tilma, right, and heads down to the Archbishop, goes to the Archbishop, uh, and they say, you again, is it? And uh, she says, yes, uh, he says, yes, Our Lady has appeared to me, wants the church built there. And she gave me, or you, this sign. Then he opens his tilma. Multiple things happen in this moment. Firstly, the roses were of a particular sort, Castilian, if I remember correctly, that only grow in Spain. The Archbishop would have known that. I think he was either from there or spent some time there. Either way, he knew those roses weren't native to Mexico. <clears throat> Secondly, it's the wrong time of year. And this is 1531, so there were no, what do we use, like large fridges to... to preserve these things for a, a longer period, it shouldn't have been possible. But also then, not only were the roses themselves miraculous, but the image left on the tilma was miraculous. Now, they didn't even know how miraculous it was, because science hadn't started to look into it. And the more we, the more we look into it, the more miraculous it becomes, if you will. Uh, like, all of the, the scientific discoveries are... It sounds like science fiction, because they're, they're so incredible. It sounds like it's made up, but it's been verified. It's been verified. Okay, where do we start? Our Lady's eyes. In Our Lady's eyes, when you magnify it, you can see what, if you will, Our Lady saw when the tilma was dropped. So you can see a reflection of the room. So you see Juan Diego, see the bishop, bishop secretary, and I think a translator. You can see them, but you can see them as the human eye sees them. So they're kind of, it's domed. It's like, it's not like, it's not like a picture. It's like as if it was painted on a cylindrical surface of con what's it? spherical, spherical surface. It's, so it's all kind of, it's somehow warped. 
uh, because it's a picture of the inside of the human eye. Okay? How would you have drawn that in 1531? With the sharpest of pencils. <laughs> you still couldn't. I mean, plus, there, there are no brush strokes. There's no under, you know, normally when you're, when you're drawing something like that, you sketch it in pencil first, then you paint on top. You paint, it's not exactly painting by numbers, but like you give yourself a, a sketch first so you get your proportions right, and then you start painting. You'll just start painting unless you're really, really good. Uh, but there are no brush strokes. So how do they get there? How do you put paint on a tilma or any cloth for that matter without a brush? Finger painting, is it? Like, I mean, but the detail is it's impossible. Also, then the, the star, the various stars on Our Lady's uh, clothes, they represent, <coughs> they are an accurate representation of the stars in the sky on the 12th of December in Mexico that night in 1531. Work that. I mean, even if you wanted to, how would you? How, how would any artist have tried to? Get, I mean, how would how would you do it? Like it's just uh, so. Um, then Our Lady standing on 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 the moon. So any sort of residual pagan gods that were there that were believed in by the Aztec people at the time. Uh, she's standing on the moon. So she's greater than the moon. She also has a, a sash around her, her waist, which was a sign. For the locals at the time that she was pregnant. And so it's such a, a pro-life, pro-family image. Afterwards there were, obviously the, the, the church was built, huge numbers of conversions and to this day about 10 million, 10 million, twice the population of Ireland goes to visit Guadalupe every year. Absolutely massive. So it's all part, though, of God's plan for, for us to have a family, a family here on earth in preparation for a divine family for all eternity, with God as Father, Our Lady is our Heavenly Mother, and Jesus as our, as our brother. So there's great need for renewal in the family, and this renewal will come because it's the building block of society. The family will go the way of the Father. If the father's heart is warmed to his children, or the father's heart is turned towards his children, as our reading says, then the family is renewed. You renew the family, you renew society. But you take the father from the family, and the family will go, will fall apart. Again, this isn't, this isn't anything against moms. There are absolutely amazing, wonderful single moms out there who ended up in that situation through no fault of their own. The father did a runner. It's not their fault. <clears throat> and they do their best but the statistics are very interesting the statistics would appear sexist but I don't really care um, they are what they are the research done right, shows that if a mom practices and dad doesn't the chances of the children practicing are about 17% so less than 1 in 5 if on the other hand the father practices and the mother doesn't the chances of the children practicing is about 80% I'll take that up with the stats not my fault Okay, but that's just, and, but you imagine, imagine, just imagine Ireland you know, for the last 40 ish years where we men have often delegated the spiritual stuff to our, to our, <coughs> to our wives, you know, to, to, to the moms. It's very rare that you see a father saying, all right, kids, car, mass, now, we're going. And, uh, you know, for, for fathers to, to lead their kids in prayer, for fathers to lead their kids in, 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 in their faith. And it's, it's not about women being, it's not, it's not about being greater or less than women or anything like that. But if a father leads his children in the faith, he represents the Divine Father, the Heavenly Father. So we ask the good Lord today for these words to be fulfilled in our time. That fathers' hearts may be turned towards their children. <coughs> that we may recognize the greatness of our Heavenly Mother, of our need for her that families all over the world may be renewed and that we may enjoy forever the glory of our heavenly family for all eternity. Amen.